Okay, it is six o'clock and I see that we are recording. Um, it is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021, and it's 6 p.m. And this is the regularly scheduled city council meeting. And um, the first thing that we do on our meetings is the Pledge of Allegiance. And so we have Harrison Hall is our youth counselor with us tonight. And I'm gonna put him on the spot without a lot of advance notice. And Harrison, are you there? And are you willing to lead us in our pledge tonight? I am, Madam Mayor. Great, then what will happen here in just a second is our IT will put the flag on and the rest of us will mute ourselves and, um, and then you can begin. Thank you very much. All righty. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Del Piccolo, who will do our roll call. Barbara Bynum. Present. Doug Glassbell. Here. Roy Anderson. Present. Dave Bowman. Present. Dave Frank. Present. Harrison Hall. Here. All city councilors and our youth council representative are present. Thank you very much. And the very first thing on our agenda tonight is a proclamation that I'm happy to read. This is Volunteers of America Day, March 8th, 2021. Whereas Volunteers of America, or VOA, has served the needs of our nation's most vulnerable people through the United States since 1896. And whereas in Western Colorado, annually VOA serves approximately 1,200 long-term care and short-term rehabilitation clients, including 50 units of housing in independent and assisted living, 160 home health patients, 147 homebound, and 220 congregate meals clients, and 350 PACE program participants. And whereas in Western Colorado, VOA provides 171 units of affordable housing for the elderly and those with disabilities in the region. And whereas in Western Colorado, in partnership with the Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource for Colorado provided options counseling to 2,069 clients in the last fiscal year. Whereas Volunteers of America nationally will celebrate the 125th anniversary of the organization's founding on March 8th, 2021. Now therefore I, Mayor Barbara Bynum, and the City Council of the City of Montrose do hereby proclaim March 8th, 2021 to be Volunteers of America Day in the City of Montrose. Congratulations, that's exciting news to be celebrating such uh, a big anniversary. And Lisa, did we have anyone from our local VOA who was here tonight who wanted to say anything? Um, I believe we have Erin Berg here. Um, I'm not okay. sure if she would like to speak, but I'll promote her to panelist in okay. case she would like to say something. I saw her name and I thought perhaps that normally what would happen is we'd be at the front of the room and and Erin and I would, um, I'd hand her this beautiful proclamation and, and tell her how happy I was that VOA was in our community and I give her the opportunity to say something. So in keeping with that, I see she's turned her video on. And um, if you wanna unmute yourself and say anything. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate all of you um, reading the proclamation and, and making it official for Volunteers of America Day on March 8th. Uh, we're super excited that it's 125 years. It's um, of course uh, not here in Western Colorado, but across the entire country. So. Uh, I, I'm really grateful for the support we received from the city council and uh, all the community, all the um, individuals in the community in Montrose. So uh, we're just very grateful to be here and continuing to provide services to uh, the variety of individuals that we, we do. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for everything that VOA does for our community. It's a really important piece of, of what makes Montrose a great community to live in. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, so next on our agenda tonight is the call for public comment for non-agenda items. So this is the portion of the meeting. If anyone is joining us from the public and they wanna tell city council what's on their mind, but it's not for a particular agenda item, this is your opportunity. And you would um, raise your hand to let us know that you wanna make public comment. And that raise hand button is at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if I see any hands, then I will read all the legal language that precedes public comment. I am not seeing anyone raising their hand. So we'll continue on our agenda tonight. And that would be um, item six, which is approval of the minutes. And this is council consideration of the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 regular council meeting. This is when I'm one here. of you makes a motion. Uh, I would move to approve the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 regular city council meeting as presented. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a first and a second, and we'll ask for a roll call vote. Barbara Bynum? Yes. Doug Glassbell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Next um, is item seven, which is a new hotel and restaurant liquor license. This is council consideration of a new hotel and restaurant liquor license with optional premises at 1350 Birch Street for the city of Montrose, a municipal corporation doing business as the Rusty Putter for consumption on the licensed premises. I will turn it over to city attorney Stephen Alcorn for the introductions. I, I will admit that this is probably the weirdest liquor license uh, application that I've done um, because normally I think I would recuse myself because everyone on the application is, I consider uh, both a friend and family members, but there's really no other way to do this but this. Um, so I acknowledge that um, you know, I'm going to be talking to Ann and, uh, you know, Tom. Um, and it's a little bizarre because I realize even though I'm doing this hearing, if Ann or Tom have a question about liquor licenses and stuff, they're going to make sure they, I mean, most of the applicants don't have my cell phone. Um, so... Uh, you know, Ann and Tom are going to text message me if they have it. So, you know, I don't want to make it look like this is a normal hearing because it isn't. Uh, but we have to uh, do it. The law requires it and there's no way around it. Uh, so, uh, Tom, you're you're on on here, right? I realize Ann's going to be doing a lot of the talking, but at the same time, I realize you're the one on the ground. Uh, you're the one that's going to be walking through the uh, uh, the restaurant and seeing who's getting served. You know, Ann and I are, you know, over at City Hall and, you know, not able to see. So I'll start with Ann. Um, sure, and Tom, if Amy you're able to up. turn your video on, we can't see you yet. If you want to turn it on, um, just so you know, it's not on right now. Oops, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, all good. I just wanted you to know. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think anybody's ever come in up <laughs> down before, but um, so uh, Anne and Tom, I mean, I, I both know that uh, you are very much concerned about underage drinking and you're both aware of the laws of the state of Colorado as far as underage drinking. Um, I'm going to ask Tom because you're going to be supervising the manager of the restaurant, right? Correct. Um, 
And I also know that you have quite a passion for the, the youth golfers and making sure the youth golfers come in. Um, and the youth golfers include uh, Connor Bell and all of his friends. So are, is there going to be, you know, Connor walks up and orders a beer, what's going to happen? <laughs> I mean, that, it just won't happen. I mean, I don't, I, I would, I wouldn't allow it to happen. And, and uh, I think our res restaurant manager won't allow it to happen either. But it, it, what's going to happen, we turn them away and they probably call their parents saying that they wanted to buy some alcohol from us. Uh, so kind of what you're saying is it, the golf course, especially when the kids come become involved, or it's a bit of a big family organization or operation, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we know, you know, you get to know all the people out there and then you know their parents. So um, that would be an easy, easy situation to handle if they, if they went up and tried to buy any alcohol. And uh, I will be the first to admit, if uh, if I have to walk the two blocks away to the bell house to yell at Connor uh, for even, <laughs> I will. I know uh, the chief of police will too. Uh, and that kind of sums up the situation we're in. We're in a, uh, in a big family organization uh, and we expect that we protect our kids and each other's kids from underage shrinking. Would you agree? Yes, I would. Absolutely. Um, and I'll ask you the same question I would ask anybody else. Are you going to make sure that the, uh, the manager uh, who is coming on board pretty soon uh, will be uh, getting over to uh, Lisa Del Piccolo's classes on alcohol, alcohol server training? Yeah, I, I think she's already certified, but we were all going to go to those classes again. Um, I think once she was on board, we were going to go ahead and get them scheduled so that we could all attend. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, and uh, we, what's the policy going to be as far as checking of IDs uh, for age? Well, I, you know, I'll learn. I don't know the exact age i know it's under if you look under something but if anybody even looks under 35 or 40 you know i think it's you have to ask for an id but i think i'll i'll learn that when i go to the uh alcohol class but you yeah, know i, I know most i think them. yeah i think what the instructors teach if they look and if they look as old as doug or older you don't have to check their id <laughs> You might be ID in a lot of people then. <laughs> uh, then I think the nice thing about the, uh, the, the golf course is that the, the, the youngsters kind of stick out like a sore thumb uh, and they're, and you know, you know who your clients are and it's uh, not someplace that, uh, you know, the high, even though high schoolers go over to golf, it's not the place that they're going to try to drink because everybody knows who they are and uh, and what the deal is as far as the city's intention. Um, the need for the community. Um, how long have you been in the uh, the golfing industry, Tom? Well, um, different aspects since 1980. Uh, 87 I've been in the golf business just different different aspects of it so in that since 1987 have you become aware of any expectations of golfers and their desires or their expectations of being able to have a beer or a alcoholic beverage after uh, they finish up golfing Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of a lot of our players enjoy sitting out on the patio and having a beer, cocktail and lunch, but it's it's pretty standard in the industry for for people to enjoy a cocktail after a round to golf. 
the, uh, the I'm touching on that because we need to show that there is a uh, desire in the neighborhood to have that. I will give you an opportunity to put a plug in. Are there very many places in Montrose that is more enjoyable once weather uh, warms up that to sit on your patio and have a beer and a burger and enjoy the view? No, there's there's no place like it. And and once we get up and running, I I think it's it's just going to be a huge hit in town. People are going to show up there. The patio is as good as it gets. Um, golf course is in good shape, and it's it's just a really good environment for people to go um, hang out and have a good time. So and. Uh, you know the uh, what we have to prove here. We need to show that there's a desire in the neighborhood or the city of Montrose to have uh, liquor served uh, and that uh, we're of moral character to enforce the laws of the city and the state of Colorado. Do you have anything to add to what Tom has already said before we turn it in uh, over to the uh, the biting and insightful questions of city council. Sure, I might just add as um, you both alluded to that we have hired a professional restaurant manager who has experienced managing a bar and a restaurant before. And in addition to seeking a liquor license, this is a full restaurant. So there'll be a full menu of food um, available whenever liquor um, and alcohol is available as well, um, including um, breakfast in the morning, um, which is um, something we're working on to expand our menu options so people can come out and have food at any time of day. Um, and um, as Tom said, we all of our staff will be going through tips training in the event that any of us interact with um, the alcohol operations of this business. And of course, we'll follow all of the applicable rules pertaining to storage of alcohol. Um, we read on the bar to make sure that really it's um, safe for all of the staff and the patrons as well, so that there's no access issues there either. Um, I think that's all I would add. Thank you. Would, would you agree that, I mean, frankly, there's a sense of ownership and responsibility that, you know, we we have people like uh yeah well we have various council members that go out and golf city employees will go out there and have their lunch there that it could very well be the most monitored um, uh, alcohol serving premises within the city limits yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, to perhaps reiterate also professional. So we're hiring restaurant professionals who will be um, overseeing this in addition to our city staff. So um, we'll have, you know, professional servers, professional cooks, um, the professional manager um, who has an extensive background working in a restaurant environment as well. Okay. Um, the, uh, I guess I would, I would probably allude to, I'm a preacher's kid and grew up with a different set of rules than everybody else, a different level of expectations that my father had with me versus everybody else. Uh, and I think we as a city are viewing the same thing with, uh, with this liquor license, that um, every time that uh, the city manager goes out, anytime I go out, anytime a council member goes out to golf, um, that we will have a greater expectation than what the law requires as to conforming with um, uh, with the liquor code. That you know, there's complying with the liquor code, and there's going above and beyond, and making sure that there's no uh, even perception of uh, favoritism or difference. So. Um, I think that's where we're going forward with this, uh, with a great deal of ownership. We don't take it lightly. Um, I think, uh, Madam Mayor, I'm not sure what questions council will have because I kind of stumbled through this hearing as well because you know it, it is like, um, you know, a 
you know, questioning your own family members. Uh, but uh, I think it would be appropriate. And I think Mr. Glassbell has some questions for us. I do as well. And I'll, I'll kick it off actually, and then defer to my fellow counselors. Um, but you've mentioned how everyone seems to know each other at the golf course. And yet, uh, I think it's really important to ask one of the questions we regularly ask, which is how do you keep people from being overserved, especially if you have to cut off someone that's a friend or a regular patron? And I think that question is probably most appropriate for Tom Young to answer because he's the one who will be there. So how do we, I mean, I, I, it's a, it's a judgment call. You can tell when people have had too much alcohol and, and I don't think it'll be an issue at all uh, telling somebody that we can't serve them anymore. Yeah, I think that's really important. I don't want to see the city, um, you know, putting ourselves in a, a bad spot or putting our community in a dangerous spot from over serving people. I think that's really important. Right. Um, Okay, my fellow counselors, I see some hands up. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Glassbell, and then I'll go to Councilor Anderson. A couple of concerns I have, Tom and, and Ann. Uh, the, the liquor license does include the entire golf course. Are we going to have anyone on the course monitoring who's drinking? I can do a call in, pick something up, and I could have a younger person with me. I uh, could be supplying liquor to. Uh, do you have any any idea how you control that at all? Well, you know, I, I think it's it's we don't obviously you can't bring your own alcohol onto the property, and then that's just going to be trying to monitor the golf course as best as you can. I mean, it is 110 acres, and and you would hope that that somebody's not giving a minor alcohol out on the golf course while they're playing. I mean, we, we'll monitor, monitor it the best as we can. And we're gonna have a beverage cart out there, so they'll be able to help monitor and, and hopefully catch any of that if it starts happening. I also we also have a lot of players. We, we have a lot of players that um, have the interest of the golf course. You know, that's one of their priorities. And, and I think that if it was going on, um, there's enough regulars out there that they would come and let us know if they see something like that. You know, we have a good men, men's club, women's club, and if, you know, we'll monitor it the best we can, but I also think a lot of our players will monitor it. Madam Mayor, if I could just add to that. Please um, do. Uh, since uh, Tom mentioned the beverage cart, I think one new thing we're adding at the course with input from Chief Hall and, um, and Greg uh, with information services is we're gonna add a camera to the beverage cart. And so it'll be set up in such a way that the person operating the cart uh, will be under video surveillance the entire time they're doing serving out on the course. And so that'll be recorded. And if there's any issues like that, we'll be able to have that tape to look back on and make sure that we're policing it that way as well. And that just helps the restaurant manager and the golf pro have some more eyes and ears out on the court. So using technology for that. I think that's really important that, that it isn't just about service at the counter in the restaurant, but you know, that liquor license does cover the whole premises and we need to apply um, those rules need to be uh, followed throughout the entire course. Councillor Anderson, I saw you also had a question. Yeah, I did. It was pretty much answered by this discussion. I, I wasn't sure that the whole golf course was covered under the license, but you've made it clear that it is. And so, yeah, I, I'm also concerned about people playing golf and drinking on every hole. And by the time they get back to, to the um, clubhouse, they're pretty inebriated. So um, Tom said they're, they're going to be careful about uh, over serving and and uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about people driving home after their round of golf, after they've had eight or nine cans of beer. So um, I, uh, you've already kind of addressed that. And I think that's good. And we need to really be strict on that sort of thing. <clears throat> I can add a couple of things. Um, just just going to say he's that. evidently seen Mr. Hall driving on a golf course. Hang, hang on. I think Mr. Bell was trying to add some comments. <laughs> Yeah, Chief Hall needs to go through a golf cart 
driving class. I, we all agree with that. Well, that has nothing to do with his drinking. That's just his no, ability to drive a golf cart. Exactly. He, yeah. Totally sober when he almost rolled over a council member. But that's a story for another time. Um, we, <laughs> during the interviews for restaurant manager and in all of our conversations with, with Tom as golf pro and Eric as assistant golf pro, we focused a lot on controlling the alcohol consumption at the course because our main marketing gimmick for the Black Canyon Golf Course is that it's a family friendly environment and we offer youth golf for free. We try to have kids um, all over the course and, and longtime users of the Black Canyon really appreciate the young people at the course and mentor them. And so it's really a big part of our hiring process and interview process and just the strategies going into this season is now that we're in charge of the liquor consumption and service, uh, we can't overserve people. And what Roy just mentioned is a problem on all golf courses. People get beer and they drink one beer per hole. And by the time they make the round after nine, that's nine beers in an hour and a half. That's a lot. And so just having people out and about, having the beverage cart out on the course on a regular basis, which will happen this season, we're very committed to that. That kind of helps Tom, because we don't have a full-time marshal on our course, like bigger, bigger city courses might, a little bit more revenue. And so having the beverage cart driver, Tom, Eric, and Kyle and his crew who are out doing the maintenance, they'll all act as our eyes and ears and try to control that a little better. Um, not that it's been a huge issue, I haven't really heard that that's been a huge issue more than you would see at any other golf course. But just, I want everyone to know in our interviews with the restaurant manager and discussions with the pro shop, uh, it's at the top of our mind and we wanna make sure that it's it remains a family friendly environment. We specifically talked to the restaurant manager about something that happens on a lot of courses where they close the restaurant down at say 9 p.m. and then the restaurant and, and golf staff hang out and drink afterwards after they're closed. We're not gonna allow that activity to take place. It's a city owned property. And uh, we've had those discussions that we're gonna close at a, an early reasonable time. And then you go somewhere else. If you wanna meet up and go to the distillery or meet up and go to one of the local bars in town, that's totally fine. But we don't wanna encourage our employees to hang out afterward and then drive home after having a few drinks. So it's a zero tolerance for us on any of this. I appreciate that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Mr. Frank, I see your hand. Bill, since you mentioned the maintenance staff and the crew and the, and the other workers on there, are we going to encourage every employee of the golf course to attend the TIPS class? We were not talking about the maintenance crew, but uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, we were going to have at least Tom, Eric, that's the pro shop supervisors, uh, Ann and I were on the liquor license, so we want to make sure we're in the know on that. And then all of the restaurant staff, so all the servers, even the cook and the manager will be attending that because you never know in a two-person, three-person environment when the cook's going to have to come out to the counter and serve a couple beers because it's jam-packed with people. So everyone on the business ops restaurant side We'll go through that together, not only to learn about the serving, a lot of us have been through that training, but also to build team. Just, it's a good way to get together and actually put it in the chat um, to Lisa Del Piccolo asking her when when's the earliest we could get a training put together. And so she'll get back to me on that. But our goal if is to have of all of those types. If some of the maintenance staff by some chance says, hey, this sounds like a great idea we would encourage them and allow them to uh, attend those tips classes as well though. Yeah, if they're interested and, and uh, they want to attend, it's not a, a huge time commitment I and mean, that'd be great. And if any council members plan on going to a special event or something like that at the golf course, or if you plan on serving uh, with Rotary or something like that at Funk Fest or one of the events in town, it's a good idea for you to attend as well. Thank you very much. Any additional comments or questions from council? Okay, thanks everyone for the good comments and the good questions. And thank you very much, uh, Tom Young, for coming to our city council meeting tonight. Um, what we do now is we hold a hearing. 
And this is the portion of the meeting for that the public would have an opportunity to comment. We have a lot of people in attendance. I don't think they're all here for the Rusty Putter liquor license, but perhaps there is someone who wishes to comment. If so, I'm looking for a raised hand on that list. I don't see any. So um, in the interest of time, we have a long agenda tonight. I'm gonna to go ahead and close the hearing and I would entertain a motion from council. Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the new hotel restaurant liquor license with prim options premises at 1350 Birch Street for the city of Montrose, a municipal corporation doing business as the Rusty Putter for consumption on the licensed premise. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a first and a second, so let's do a vote. Barbara Bynum? Yes. Doug Glassbell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Moving on, the next item on our agenda tonight is Ordinance 2527, which is a first reading. Um, this is a council consideration of an ordinance for the city of Montrose granting and authorizing the conveyance of an interest in city owned real estate pursuant to section 1-9-2 of the official code of the city of Montrose. Montrose. This is the Woodgate Road realignment. So I will turn it over to city engineer, Scott Murphy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so I'll give a quick, just a real quick introduction to the project and how this um, action item falls in with all the others. Um, and then I'm also joined here by Douglas Tuller, who is a representative of the landowner uh, that will be running this project across. So um, he's also available if you have any questions. Um, so with that, I'll screen share here. Just one sec. Um, so what we're looking at here, so you guys, can you guys see the memo from the packet? Okay, so um, within that, I didn't go too deep into the background. We've talked about it um, at several work sessions um, and uh, um, had several videos and public meetings and outreach efforts about the project. So I think I'll just introduce it generally um, and direct people to those materials uh, so they can get up to speed on the project if they haven't um, been following any of those previous meetings. So if you go to uh, movemo.co, which is our capital projects webpage, um, pull it over here. Um, within that, we have a current capital projects tab. Um, and underneath that is, you can find the Woodgate realignment project. Um, within that page, we have overview drawings showing the footprint, um, some project statistics, a narrative. Um, you can also find videos kind of summarizing how we got to where we got to um, as far as, uh, or how we arrived at the alignments and, and all the evaluations done some frequently asked questions, um, some videos from previous council uh, meetings also. Uh, so everything you'd ever wanna know about the Woodgate realignment in one place. Um, um, so I won't go back into that again, unless there's any questions. Um, that's kind of been out in the public since we held a, a Zoom style open house back in January um, after all of these, um, all this property work came together. Um, so this first item here is the vacation ordinance for the, the right-of-way. So um, with the realignment of the road, uh, there's portions of the old right-of-way and previously dedicated rights-of-way that essentially become obsolete. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail on that here in a minute. Um, this is one of three ac action items related to closing out the property acquisition. Um, the second of those is a replat of the property uh, boundary. So with the new alignment comes, you know, we get rid of the old right of way and then we're effectively realigning it into the new right of way through a replat to get all the property lines cleaned up um, so it matches the new road um, and lends itself well to future development of this area. Uh, the third piece we'll talk, and that one we're, we don't have any action on tonight because that only has to be um, voted on once, whereas these ordinances um, have two readings. So that's why we're talking about them tonight and we'll talk about them again in two more weeks. Um, the last of those is the project rezone, which is the next agenda item. Um, Amy will primarily talk about that, but we can dive into some of the justification for that too. 
Um, after all that solidified, we looked to close on the land uh, April 1st. Um, the project itself is out to bid right now. Um, so we'll be opening bids in a couple weeks and plan to come to city council and ultimately look to award a construction contract on April 20th. Um, so, so getting close, this is step 22 of 25. <laughs> um, we're just about there. Um, so honing in on this action item here, the right of way vacation ordinance. Um, so I'll come down to the figure, which is one of the exhibits within the ordinance. Um, all of the green property shown on this uh, exhibit here is property that's owned by RDMJK Woodgate Investments. Um, and that's who uh, Doug Tuler, who's joining us, uh, represents. The purple portions are old rights of way that once we have this new realignment, essentially become obsolete. So, you know, one way to think about them is the, the ordinance vacates them and we're rotating them over into this new alignment and the plat gives us the new ones. It's just kind of the the way the, the process works um, to make that happen. So um, what you'll see here is just the overview to give, to kind of set the table for the, the basis for the, the uh, right away vacation ordinance. And then within that are two uh, exhibits and my acrobat just aired out. So um, you have to take my word for it on the second one. Uh, the, uh, so one for each of those that have standalone boundaries that make it the legal um, description of what gets vacated. Um, so with that, because I can't share if I wanted to because my computer just froze, I will stop sharing um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, Council, we've talked about this for quite a while. It's been one of the, our big capital projects for 2021. Um, are there any questions specific to this um, first reading of this ordinance? Okay, then I will go ahead and um, hold a hearing as required when we have the first reading of an ordinance. Ordinances are basically city laws. We vote on them twice at, at subsequent meetings. And the first time we vote, we hold what's called a hearing, but we also accept public comment the second time we vote. I'll look at our attendees list tonight. I don't think anyone's here to make major comments. And I thank Mr. Tuller for being here. It doesn't sound like there are specific questions for the landowner, but I appreciate him being available. Any questions? Okay. Um, then I will officially close the hearing and accept a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd be happy to make a motion to pass ordinance 2527 on first reading as presented. Second time. Thanks, we have a first and a second, so we'll take a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassfell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So that leads us right into the next ordinance, which is ordinance 2528, which is also a first reading, like Mr. Murphy said. And this is council consideration of an ordinance amending the zoning district designation of lot one of the RDMJK Woodgate property rezone map from B2 highway commercial district, R2 low density district and R1B small estate district to B3 commercial general commercial district and lots two and three of the RD MJK Woodgate property rezone map from R2 low density district and R1B small estate district to B2 highway commercial district. And I will turn it over to senior planner, Amy Sharp. Thank you, Madam Mayor and city council. And thanks Scott for the easy introduction for me to lead into the rezone. Um, so as he mentioned, concurrent with the replat, the underlying zoning is going to have to be updated as well to match um, the lot configurations as shown in your packet. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen here. I think you guys all know where this one is located. This just shows the general location of the project area. Um, Scott already talked through the background of the project as well, so I won't reiterate all that. I think you guys all understand that concept. Um, this is the current zoning as it is right now. Um, and Madam Mayor kind of explained all the current zoning, um, the B2, the R2, 
R1B and B3 as shown by the different colors here on this map. And then figure two is how we're going to rezone it to um, B2 and B3 so that it's split kind of right down the middle of the new Woodgate Road realignment. So this is the official rezone plat that shows you how that's identified. Once again, everything to the east is zoned um, as the as one as B2, and then to the um, west of it is B3. And so the utilization of the B2 and B3, B3 and B2 zoning along this frontage allows for a consistent land use pattern with the surrounding areas. Um, just by showing a zoning gradient, as you progress towards existing residential areas situated to the east. Um, the eastern edge of the rezone boundary generally follows a break in topography um, with the residential areas towards the east. And this creates kind of a natural break between the commercial uses that front the minor arterial and the rest residential areas that start at this boundary. So this is our rezone criteria. Um, these are the conditions that need to be met um, anytime we do an amendment to our official zoning map. The proposed rezone, as we've stated a couple times now, is B2, Highway Commercial District, and the B3 General Commercial District. Um, this shows you the intent of each one of those districts, and it's consistent um, with the other types of zoning that you see in this general area um, on the adjacent properties. Um, it is adjacent to properties that are currently zoned B3, General Commercial District, B2, Highway Commercial District, and then there's also some R2, Very Low Density Residential District, and R1B, um, small state residential district in the nearby area. According to our comprehensive plan, this area is identified as general commercial and also residential mixed density low. Um, and so this fits in very nicely with um, the surrounding area and what the land use map and our comprehensive plan intended for this area. The Planning Commission did recommend approval to rezone the property um, as we've stated at their February 10th meeting. Um, staff finds that this rezone criteria have been met and that it meets the intent of each of those districts. It is in compliance with the comprehensive plan and therefore staff is recommending approval of this rezone request. And I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, we will hold a hearing on this as well since it's an ordinance. Before we do that, do my fellow counselors or youth counselor have any questions for Ms. Sharp? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so I will officially um, hold a hearing. I will open that hearing and look to our attendees list to see if there's any public comment. Again, I wanna thank Mr. Tuller for being here and being available for council questions. Do you have any comments you wish to make as part of this hearing? Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Mayor, can you hear me okay? Or? I sure can, thank you, okay. yes. I, I really don't have much to add. I, I, I do wanna take this chance again, I've said this a couple of times, is uh, uh, your staff's been exceptional through this whole process. You know, working with Scott and Amy and, and Ann and, and everybody, it's really been a, quite a, a reassuring, uh, good process. We appreciate all their work. And really other than that, I don't have much to add. So. Great. Well, thank you for those comments. It definitely has been a lot of work and we appreciate you working um, with us and our staff. I know a lot has gone into all these parcels and all these boundaries and all of the um, work. So thank you. I'm looking to see if there's any additional public comment before I close the hearing. I do not see any, so I will officially close the hearing. And if there are no further comments or questions from council, I don't see any, then um, we could have a motion. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve ordinance 2528 on first reading. I'll second that. Thank you, we have a first and a second, so we'll have a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. Aye. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So moving on on our agenda, our next item is item 10, which is the Colorado Outdoors Amended Plan Development Number 2 Preliminary PD Plot. This is council consideration of the Colorado Outdoors Amended Plan Development Number 2 Preliminary Plan Development Plot. And I will turn it over to senior planner, Amy Sharp. 
Thank you again, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen here once again. So this one, I'm actually combining my presentation for agenda items 10 and 11 into one presentation because they're directly related to one another. They kind of go hand in hand. And I felt that that would be um, easier for everybody to understand if I kind of combine them into one presentation. So tonight, there are two separate actions, as you see in your agenda. One is for approval of the Colorado Outdoors Amended Plan Development Number 2 Preliminary Plan Development Plat. And then the second one is for the final plan development plat. Um, both of these are on the agenda tonight. Um, I think I put in your packet, it said March 10th, but obviously that's tonight, March 2nd. So apologize for that. Um, but this is a little different than a plat, like when we do a preliminary plat and a final plat in that the PDs don't require infrastructure improvements, which is why we're able to approve both the preliminary PD and the final PD in one meeting. And so this is the location of the area. I think most of you are familiar with the Colorado Outdoors location. Um, the purpose of this project is to remove the Colorado Outdoors South boundary line adjustment lots two and three from the master PD so that a new separate multifamily plan development can be created for those properties. And that's actually going to be next on our agenda item tonight. So we'll discuss that in more detail. So um, the 20% open space requirement is still met, even with the removal of this um, southern boundary um, to create its own PD. So a little bit on the project background, this project site kind of identified um, in the black outline area here is approximately 98 plus acres. Um, the Colorado Outdoors property was originally developed over 165 acres. Their original plan development was approved back in November of 2017. And then it was amended for the first time in October of 2018. This now is the second amendment of the PD. All of the phase one public infrastructure was completed in December of 2018. And the filing number one of the final plat was also done in December of 2018. So next, I just want to kind of give you an overview of the plan development process. You guys are somewhat familiar with this because this follows the same process as what a subdivision would go through. Um, so in our code, plan developments follow the same process as a subdivision. So it starts with a sketch plan, um, which goes just to planning commission for just a general review and no formal action is taken. And it goes to the preliminary process and then the final plot process. But again, the biggest difference between a PD and a um, just a regular preliminary plot and final plot is that there aren't any infrastructure improvements um, associated with this plan development. So we're able to approve both the preliminary plan development and the final plan development tonight. So as I mentioned, this is the second amendment to the Colorado Outdoors plan development. They've chosen to move forward with a plan development, um, you know, years ago in order to provide flexibility with respect to their dimensional requirements. And it also just helps encourage development of tracts of land in accordance with an overall plan of development. It helps provide opportunities for um, increased open space. So with a PD, um, they're required to have a minimum of 20% open space requirements. Um, another benefit is if they're wanting to do more than one building on one lot um, with more than one residential unit within it, um, the plan development process is required. So as I mentioned, um, this is a way for them to kind of develop areas of land with a coordinated and planned matter. So it can include parts and open space, clustered development. Um, they can have shared infrastructure and shared amenities that might not otherwise be um, achieved if smaller parcels were developed independently. Approval of a plan development is purely discretionary. If the city and applicant don't agree on all the required conditions of the plan, the city can deny approval. We can also impose um, conditions but at the same time, if the developer does not accept all those conditions, they would just adhere to the regular subdivision and zoning requirements set forth on that property. This one's a little different in that, like I said, this one's already been approved and we're just going through a second amendment of the plan development, but I just wanted to give a little bit of history on plan developments for those who may be new. So a previous plat note on the 2018 amended PD um, stated setbacks for all residential units within the industrial zone lots would be subject to reduced setbacks. And this amendment is actually specifying a difference in the reduced setbacks for single family and multifamily housing 
versus townhomes and duplex housing in these industrial zoned lots. So they kind of want to differentiate a little bit in what they're going to allow for single family and multifamily versus townhome and duplex. And you can see those setbacks in your packet and also here on the slide um, to show how those differ a little bit. Another variation is that buildings could be placed within 20 feet of the existing adjacent properties, which are zoned residential. Um, the norm is usually 100 feet, um, but we do allow variations to our PD um, through the PD for that reason. Um, we're also setting a maximum building height of 60 feet in this area. And then in a PD, we can also allow for modular buildings to be allowed for residential construction through this process. So that's another variation that's being requested as part of the plan development. Hey, Amy, can I back you up for just one second? Of course. Um, when you were talking about the plan development with, and could you back up, I think, yeah, two, one more slide. This one? On the second bullet point, could you kind of go uh, to explain a little bit if the developer does not accept all the conditions, what that means that development must adhere to the other standards? Sure, of course. So our standard subdivision requirements are in section four or seven of our municipal code. So the plan development is going to um, lots of times request reduced setbacks or um, some of these other variations that you've seen, like a difference in the building height requirement and different things like that. But if they don't um, accept the conditions that are imposed upon their plan development at the time that they take it to planning commission or city council, they can withdraw their application and not move forward with the plan development. And they would then just adhere to all the standard subdivision regulations that any other development would go through for a standard subdivision. So they'd have to adhere to all of these setback requirements that are required for that zoning district. Um, they'd have to adhere to the current um, density that's allowed for that zoning district and those types of things. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, so in, in this case that they wouldn't have to come back to the planning commission or council for this, as long as they're adhering to the standard subdivision and zoning requirements, correct? Well, there's two differences. So a standard subdivision if somebody is wanting to construct um, just one building on one lot, that is done administratively. Or if somebody is wanting to do a minor subdivision, that's called, um, that consists of somebody that wants to do three lots or less, that is also done administratively through the city. So those, they would not have to go back through the planning commission or city council for approval. However, if they're wanting to subdivide their property into four lots or more, they would go through the standard subdivision process, which once again goes through planning commission and city council for approval. Great, that's a good clarification, thank you. Sure. So these are our plan development review standards. So these are the criteria for which a plan development should be um, reviewed and approved just under these conditions. I won't read through all those. I know those are in your packet and you guys are all able to read those, but if you have questions on any of them, feel free to reach out. Um, these are also the review standards that we um, submit to the Planning Commission when they um, discuss whether or not a project should be approved or not. So once again, we have two separate actions and two separate plots that are here before you tonight. So this is the Colorado Outdoors Plan Development Plan. This is the preliminary one. So you kind of see it down in the bottom right corner here. This shows that it's preliminary. And then directly following that is the final. There's absolutely no difference between these two plots other than the first one says that it's a preliminary PD and the second one says that it's a final PD. And so that those are the only two differences between the two tonight. So we're removing the Southern section, but we're also making some changes to the PD itself. Correct. And are those changes, changes the city wanted to see or changes the landowner wanted to see? How do those changes come up? It was a little bit of both actually. So, and I might have Scott um, chime in if he feels like it too, because he's been the project manager for Colorado Outdoors. So he knows the history on some of this more than I do. Um, the request to change the setbacks or identify them more in detail for single family and multifamily homes versus townhomes and duplexes um, was something that they requested. Um, they also changed the maximum building height in order to address um, things from the airport to make sure that the building was not going to be allowed to just be any height possible. We wanted to make sure that that was in compliance with the airport since it's so close by. And then there are some things that the city um, wanted to put on there also just to clarify. So some of the things that we had requested were 
um, we wanted to clarify that a PD allows them to put uh, multiple buildings on one lot because that wasn't clarified in the first round or that modular construction was allowed for residential buildings. Those were some things that we wanted to clean up um, in the second amendment to make it a little clearer as well as to what was allowed. So even when a plan development is approved, it can be amended. I mean, that's what we're doing tonight. So, okay. Um, I guess that's not really a question. I'm just thinking. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, the unique thing about plan development is that um, everybody who's a owner, landowner within it has signature authority. So as you start getting more and more landowners, they get harder to amend. Um, and so that's kind of one thought with the, doing these amendments now is to try and get a best shot to have it. Hopefully this is the last one, um, just because it'll get harder and harder as you get more and more landowners in there um, and have it encapsulate any development scenario that we envision under the master plan of, of Colorado outdoors. Okay, so that's why we see signatures, for example, from the landowner where they plan to build a hotel and that height limit won't be a problem for them because they're signing on and have agreed to this. Okay. Correct. Thanks. So just a quick clarification on that point that all of the prior uh, landowners are bound by this amended PD and anyone who is a current landowner in this area has to sign off on this PD amendment to state that they are in agreement with it. And that's why, like Scott said, we try to address any issues that we think um, could come up, you know, now <laughs> while we don't have, you know, 30 landowners in here because it would just get harder as time goes on to get a PD amendment with many more signatures on here. We're trying to get all of the changes we foresee necessary done right now to make sure it's as clean and cohesive a document as they can get. Right, based upon the master plan for that area. Perfect, thank you. Sure. And so this is just kind of a brief overview of the comprehensive plan and our code as it relates to plan development. Um, so the comprehensive plan, while a very important guiding document, um, it's not a legally binding document, but it does provide guidance for us for our zoning and other land use decisions. It is possible for sections of the comprehensive plan to conflict and it is reasonable um, to know that a decision may not satisfy every single aspect within the comprehensive plan. Um, the future land use plat map within the comprehensive plan illustrates some general but somewhat flexible locations and extents for various uses and densities. Whereas the municipal code and the zoning regulations specifies land uses and densities, bulk and height requirements, setbacks, and other development standards that are actually allowed, with, allowed within each zoning district. So the zoning code is a lot more specific than what the comprehensive plan is. So once a uh, property is zoned, um, those are the different use by rights that they're allowed based on the zoning that's set for that property. And that is legally binding, correct? Correct. And so in our comprehensive plan, this area is identified as an employment center, which is um, right in line with what's being developed in this area, as well as the River Greenway Regional Park. That's, you know, everything that's along the river there. Um, I put in some excerpts from our comprehensive plan to kind of identify what some of the intended uses are for those two areas. And same thing, I'm not going to read through these since they're in your packet and you've seen them a few times. Um, next, I just wanted to highlight the intent of the different zoning districts that are in this area. So this area of Colorado Outdoors um, has a lot of different zoning districts. Um, so I'll just read through the different zoning districts that exist in that area. I'll let you read through um, what the intent is. And if you have questions on any of those intents of the zoning district, feel free to ask. But um, we have I-1 Light Industrial District, which makes up the bulk of this area. There's also some R3A, medium high density district within this uh, area. There's also some R6, medium density manufacturing housing district, and also some PE public district, which comprises most of that river corridor. Next, this is also in your packet, but kind of highlights what the zoning regulations are. So these are the um, standard regulations for the different setbacks and lot sizes for the different zoning districts that are in this area. Um, any residential use that's located in the I-1 zoning district um, actually goes back to and refers to the R3A zoning district when looking at what the setbacks would be. So again, this is for a standard subdivision. And so you can see the differences between 
what would be required in a standard subdivision versus the deviations that they're asking for in this plan development for the different front rear side setbacks um, for multifamily, single family home versus the townhome and duplex style setbacks. For clarification on that, I know I'm being a little bit. No, that's uh, okay. Um, but for clarification, uh, a dwelling on an I-1 uh, would be, it's like a caretaker uh, facility, like at a, uh, a uh, storage units or something like that, or uh, owner's apartment on an uh, industrial lot. Is that what that would be? Yeah, so just a prime example is if somebody comes in and wants to build an apartment complex, um, in the I-1 zoning, they're going to go back to the R3A zoning district and look under all others. And that's where you determine the um, square footage for the minimum lot size and the minimum setbacks for that property. So that's just an example. Or if somebody is wanting to build single family homes in the I-1 resident, in the I-Zone light industrial district that is allowed as a use by right. Um, and then they would just refer to the R3A single family line to determine what the minimum lot size and setbacks are for single family homes in that zoning district. So how is this R allowed in um, the industrial one zone? It's not just those one offs. It's you could build a house in the industrial yep. one. Okay. Yes. All the way up to multifamily housing, single family homes, duplexes and multifamily housing are all allowed as a use by right in the light industrial district. So the Planning Commission um, held their meeting on February 10th, and at that time they did recommend approval of the preliminary plan development plat for the Colorado Outdoors amended plan development number two, and it was a unanimous vote. And similar to um, a subdivision preliminary plat and final plat, the final PD does not go to Planning Commission, it only comes to City Council. Um, so that's why you're seeing both the preliminary PD and the final PD tonight as two separate actions. Um, staff analysis is that we believe that this project is in compliance with the plan development regulations in section 4424 of our code. It is in substantial conformity with the city of Montreux comprehensive plan. We believe that the proposed use is compatible with the existing zoning and the general conditions in the area and it does not appear to be adverse to the public health safety and welfare. And we are recommending approval of the Colorado Outdoors amended plan development number two, including both the preliminary plan development plat and the final plan development plat that we reviewed tonight. With that, I'll open it up to any other questions that you guys have. Thank you so much for not only a comprehensive presentation, but a very comprehensive packet of material for us to read tonight. Sure. Okay, any council questions or comments? Okay then this, um, what we have tonight is, she put them together, but when it comes to council action, we have two separate things to vote on tonight and we'll do them separately, each with their own public comment, just to follow our agenda um, exactly. So the first one is the, um, the preliminary PD plat, and I will open it up to any public comment on that before we have a motion and a vote. And then we'll move on to the final um, PD plot. I don't see any hands going up from all of our attendees, so I would entertain a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the Colorado Outdoors amended planted development number two preliminary planned development plan. Second. Um, we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Glasspell and I heard uh, Councilor Anderson first with a second and now we'll have a vote. Barbara Vina. Aye. Doug Glasspell. Aye. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman. Yes. Dave Frank. Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to the final PD plot for the same Colorado Outdoor Amended Plan Development number two. Um, I will also accept public comment, although I'm guessing if there wasn't any on the first, there won't be any on the second, but nonetheless, let me check. I do not see any, so we could have a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd move to approve the Colorado Outdoors amended plan development number two final plan development plan. I'll second that. 
Thank you. We had a motion from Councillor Frank and a second from Councillor Bowman, and we can vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassfell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And then moving on to item 12 um, and 13, my guess is that we're gonna kind of hear about these together <laughs> because we have a preliminary and a final. Um, this is the base camp preliminary plans development. This is council consideration of the base camp preliminary plan development. And I will turn it over to senior planner, Amy Sharp. All right, thank you very much again, Madam Mayor. And I forgot I was supposed to turn that over to Scott to make sure he didn't have any additional words of wisdom for the Colorado Outdoors project, being the project manager. So I have to apologize to him and I will remember this time after base camp. <laughs> All right, let me start by sharing my screen. All right, so as you mentioned, you are correct. Um, but this one, I'm actually combining agenda items 12, 13, and 14 all into one presentation. Um, just to make it easier, they're all related. Um, just thought it would streamline things for you guys a little bit and help make every, all the pieces fit together. Um, so we got three separate actions um, related to the base camp project tonight. It will be approval of the base camp preliminary plan development, approval of the base camp final plan development, and then approval of the base camp preliminary plat for the subdivision component. So again, three separate actions, their agenda items 12, 13, and 14. Um, this is just an overview of the schedule, where we've been and where we're going. Um, tonight is the city council hearing, as I mentioned, for um, all those three separate actions. And we had the planning commission hearing for the preliminary PD um, back on February 10th. So the base camp subdivision is a multifamily proposed development that's located at the southern end of the Mira project. So this is in the Colorado outdoors area once again. Um, the project site is approximately 3.6 acres in size. It is all zoned as I-1 light industrial district um, and as part of the Mira project that was initiated back in 2017. This plan development for base camp is being created in order to replace the Colorado outdoors plan development that these properties were originally a part of. Um, they will remain a part of the Montrose Urban Renewal Authority. And as you can see here, we're not changing zoning or anything, and it is consistent with the zoning on the surrounding properties. We've got I-1 directly to the north and Colorado outdoors as well. So once again, here's the flow chart of our plan development and subdivision process. It goes through the sketch plan process, which is reviewed um, by planning commission. They don't take any formal action at that time. And then there's the preliminary stage and the final stage. The differences between um, a PD and a subdivision is that the, between the preliminary plat and final plat stage for the subdivision component is when um, the infrastructure improvements are take place. So as I mentioned, this is I-1 zoning and kind of as we talked about in the last one, multifamily housing is allowed as a use by right in this zoning district. The applicant could place just one apartment building on this one lot without having to go through the plan development process. They would just go through site development, which is a reviewed and approved administratively um, at the staff level. Um, alternatively, they could also complete a minor subdivision application, which is also approved administratively at the staff level where they would could subdivide this parcel into three lots and then place one building on each lot without having to go through the plan development process. So those are kind of some things that um, Mr. Frank, you know, referred to as well in the last meeting. Um, they would have to adhere to all the regulations set forth in our zoning code for setbacks and density. Um, this one, however, the applicant has chosen to move forward with a plan development application because it provides flexibility with respect to their dimensional requirements and also encourages development of tracts of land with an overall plan development. And also it creates that 20% open space requirement that's required for all plan developments. If an applicant wants to have more than one building on one lot, then that's when a plan development process is required. And that's what the applicant is requesting tonight. So just as I mentioned in my last presentation, this is a way for development to occur in a coordinated and planned manner. It helps to include open space areas, cluster development and shared infrastructure. 
And once again, if um, this is purely discretionary, if the city and applicant don't agree on all the conditions of the plan, the city can deny approval. We can also unilaterally impose conditions. And once again, if the developer does not accept the conditions, then they could withdraw their PD application and just adhere to the standard subdivision and zoning requirements. So this proposal, their plan development variations are listed here. They're asking to place multiple buildings on one parcel. They will be requesting setbacks for the single family and multifamily residential buildings to be um, what you see here, the five foot side, 15 foot front, rear and corner lot, and then townhomes and duplexes um, would be zero foot side and then 15 foot front, rear and corner. Um, once again, the residential buildings could be placed within 15 feet of the existing adjacent properties that are zoned residential instead of 100 feet. That's a variation. Um, a maximum building height of 45 feet shall be allowed. So that gives them um, the ability to um, build higher apartments, but also they're trying to stay once again within the requirements of the airport that's located nearby. So we didn't want to um, just allow the zoning to be um, as high as possible because we want to make sure that they fell within the regulations that are set forth by the airport. And then once again, the modular buildings are allowed for residential construction. That's another variation that plan developments allow if um, identified in the plan development plan. Once again, these are the plan development review standards found in our code. I'll let you read through those. And if you have questions, um, feel free to ask me. These are the same review standards that the Planning Commission um, reviewed. This next map shows the base camp preliminary plan development plan. So this identifies all the different deviations from city standards that I talked about in the previous slides. It also shows um, the open space requirement and how those requirements were met. And then just general notes on other things that are allowed per the PD. Once again, the only difference between the preliminary plan development and the final plan development is they put it in the title. This one's the preliminary. The second one is the final, and those are the only two differences between the two, and there are no infrastructure um, requirements that need to be met in order to approve the final after the preliminary. Um, next, I'll go into just a little bit of subdivision application details because this is going to apply to the preliminary plat um, component of what you'll be reviewing tonight. So a subdivision or a subdivided land means that a parcel of land has been divided into two or more parcels, lots or tracts, or other interests that can include condominiums, townhomes, or other common interest ownership and in any act creating such results. So our municipal code outlines this process and standards for subdivision applications. Um, the preliminary plat and the proposed improvements have to comply with all the requirements in our code, and that's in section 475. And our planning commission, um, when they review this project, they have to make sure that all the um, things that are being requested in the preliminary plat meets the standards outlined in that section of our code. And this is just an excerpt from our code that talks about what those review standards are. This is also in your packet as one of your exhibits. And these are all the things that we review as well. So when this comes to us as a preliminary plat or plan development, these are all the different standards that staff and some of our outside agencies that are part of our review team as well um, review the project for to make sure that it's in compliance with our code before we bring it before planning commission and city council. This next map shows the actual base camp subdivision preliminary plat. So this is page one. It talks about um, just the different conditions or miscellaneous plat notes that are going to be set forth on the subdivision. These are standard for um, most subdivisions that we take that take place in our city. This map shows how the property would actually be subdivided. So it shows the lot one, lot two, and then an out lot A that would be developed in the future, as well as the tract A. And then this is just more of the preliminary plat, shows more details. This is also in your packet. And then once again, this is just a review of the differences between our comprehensive code, our comprehensive plan and our municipal code. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this again because it's identical to what I just went over with the Colorado Outdoors project. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask me on that as well. Um, this property is also located in the Comprehensive Plan Land Use Chapter 3 as Employment Center and River Greenway Regional Park, just as it is in the Colorado Outdoors one. So they're very similar. 
Um, there are a number of land use concepts that are recommended in the comprehensive plan. Um, and I just want to go over those because those are common terms that come up when we're um, dealing with plan developments and new subdivisions. Um, wanted to highlight that there are just some concepts that are recommended, such as feathering of densities. Um, and I kind of put a definition in there so that you wouldn't have to search through the code to see what feathering of density means. Um, this basically means that when high density lots immediately adjacent to very low density lots should be avoided. Um, but when they can't be, they can be mitigated by different buffer transitions, um, such as increased setbacks. They can also have gradual changes in building mass, or they can do things like landscape planting and other types of buffering methods as well. Um, another concept in our land use plan talks about um, allowing a mix of uses or a range of densities in order to foster a diversity of housing choices within our community, as well as a variety within new neighborhoods and zoning districts. In our comprehensive plan, our current one, we have several goals, policies, and actions that speak to housing. And I wanted to highlight this because it's, you know, a new um, big multifamily housing project that's coming to our community and just wanted to highlight how it does meet um, several of our policies and goals that are in our current comprehensive plan. Um, it helps to encourage a variety of housing types in new neighborhoods that helps to ensure affordable housing is dispersed throughout the community. And then goal number nine, policy 9.4, um, it talks about how when we're um, talking about applying mixed densities and we're taking into account adjacent land uses, the density transitions should be gradual. And what that just means is that it shouldn't see two zoning categories. So it doesn't necessarily refer to um, what the density is in your neighboring property, but how it's zoned. So in this property, um, it was already zoned as I-1, and that's consistent with the zoning and the surrounding properties as well. So there's no change in um, you know, it exceeding more than two zoning categories. So it meets that housing goal as well. This one just um, sets forth what the purpose of the light industrial district is. And as I mentioned before, multifamily housing is allowed as a use by right in the I-1 zoning district. Um, they are seeking setback variations in order to accommodate an overall coordinated plan of development. So once again, here's the same um, section from our code that you saw before that shows the minimum lot size and setbacks for the various um, zoning designations in this area. However, they are asking for re reduced setbacks for the zoning district as I showed in an earlier slide. The Planning Commission um, on February 10th, they did recommend approval of the base camp preliminary plan development and the preliminary plat. It was a unanimous vote. And this is the standard condition that was applied to the preliminary plat. And this is the same standard condition that's applied to just about every preliminary plat that we do. Staff analysis of the plan development and plat is that um, we believe that all of them are in compliance with the plan development and the subdivision regulations set forth in our code. It is in substantial conformity with the City of Montrose Comprehensive Plan. It is compatible with the existing zoning and the general use of the area. It doesn't appear to be adverse to the public health, safety, and welfare. And therefore, we are recommending approval of all three actions as presented tonight. I'll open it, or I think I'm going to turn it over actually to Scott this time. I'm going to remember <laughs> to see if he had anything to add before you guys have questions. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is just a little background on uh, so why we're, you know, so the last action retracted the old PD and now we're making a new PD. Um, so the whole southern end of Colorado Outdoors was always envisioned as a residential project. Um, this kind of helps the PD for that project be tailored to those uses. Um, so what fits residential really well might not necessarily fit commercial and industrial very well. And to try and find something that fits all of it is relatively difficult. Um, and then if you need to amend, you know, as we talked about earlier, amending those, um, you know, gets harder. So if there are two separate ones, if the residential needs to change as development patterns change, you know, they're able to. And then same thing on the commercial and industrial sides as you get further to the north. Um, if you remember um, from previous meetings starting, oh, year and a half ago, you know, this is part of this overall product is part of a partnership between the URA, the city, um, and then Kurt Sukup, who's joining us here, and I'll turn it over to him in a second. But uh, um, the city will be helping with the infrastructure on this project. We open bids for that tomorrow. Um, so that'll be coming before council um, pretty soon. Um, and I think I'd also like to give Kurt a chance just to give, um, you guys remember him from the previous meetings, but just to 
um, give you a, or have him give you a quick overview of his vision for the, the product that will actually be taking place um, within this plan development so you can understand, get some understanding of the basis for some of the variances and things of that sort. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. And then we also have the designers here with us if you have um, any questions and the Dragoos are also joining us here too. So thank you. Great. Welcome to Mr. Sukup. Remember to turn um, turn your mic back on. Thank you for the reminder. I greatly appreciate everyone's time. And uh, it's great to see everybody and see everyone as well uh, during this difficult year. And it's unfortunate that uh, this has been a year and a half, I guess, in the process. And you saw some preliminary things very early on. And we thought it might be uh, interesting just for you to see, uh, just as we are evolving, what uh, we're sort of thinking of. <clears throat> as you know, we have now purchased all 25 acres. In addition, we have bought a purchase, um, a parcel on Gratton Avenue, uh, one of the two buildings that are there. Uh, and we have been just evolving in uh, our grand plan for this area. We're certainly uh, trying to tie this area into all the work that is being done on the river, as well as the walkway that is, uh, goes through the property um, by enhancing this area uh, to have its own greenway, uh, its own walkway through the pro property. But tonight, uh, what the most pro important thing is, is these apartment buildings. The remaining uh, parcel, uh, 20 some acres, we will be evolving and you'll see this, I'm, I'm sure many more times, looking at different types of product uh, from duplexes to townhomes to uh, single family housing and additional multifamily. Um, the apartments as uh, Creighton, if you could turn the next page, uh, is, what we discussed really uh, early on, it'll be 96 units right now, uh, half or one bedroom, half or two bedroom. Um, we have created these with lots of storage space. This is a outdoor community, which we're thrilled to be part of. Um, and, you know, so we have uh, storage that's going to be right outside each unit uh, so that we don't have a lot of stuff sitting around outside. Uh, people can have storage with their kayaks or fishing equipment or whatever it may be. We're going to, we will also have a significant uh, storage down below so that uh, people have the ability to store most of their materials and things that they are using underneath. Um, with that, I'd like to have Creighton just give you a real general view of um, what we're hoping to achieve. Creighton, go ahead. And you need to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Creighton Sukup, and uh, thanks for everyone, everyone's consideration and being here tonight. Um, first thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, how we thoughtfully designed um, this site plan. I'm going to move it over to here so we can get kind of an aerial view. Um, you see over here, this is where the apartments are going. Um, in the center place is the greenway, as well as uh, the spray stitch that we're resurfacing to be, you know, somewhat similar to a small creek. Switch back over to here. Um, you know, the point of the greenway was to create a space for um, residents as well as the public um, to enjoy. Um, one reason why we moved our setbacks back a little bit was um, to allow um, this greenway and to preserve the trees and the current rice ditch that goes to the property. Um, we have already been working with various partnerships with the public. Um, we've met with the botanical gardens that do uh, kind of satellite gardens and work with them. Um, we started conversations with artists to do sculptures through the Greenway. There's also uh, murals in some of the public spaces on the buildings. Um, and also are developing trail systems through the Greenway that will uh, connect to uh, the Riverside Trail. 
here is just a mood board of uh, what we're thinking for the greenway. Um, we're preserving, again, a lot of the vegetation as well as the race ditch and all the wetlands that are on the north side of the site. Uh, here's our initial uh, elevations and renderings for the multifamily buildings. Um, they're meant to uh, follow the design guidelines of the uh, Colorado Outdoors and uh, Mira Vision, as well as uh, adhere to the natural vegetation and you know to make sure that the buildings look like they belong there and not something that has been plopped on. Here is a quick review of our floor plans. As um, Kurt mentioned, um, you know we're really trying to create spaces that are meaningful to um, residents as well as uh, new residents moving to Montrose. That includes, you know, an indoor/outdoor spaces with big uh, balconies as well as storage closets and gear closets when you walk in. Uh, we plan to make a lot of outdoor public uh, spaces for residents as well that will have grills and walkways, um, little amphitheaters and kind of a bunch of uh, items throughout the greenway um, that'll improve the quality of life. Uh, and that means that's what we have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Council, I see uh, Councilor Frank's hand up. I noticed that um, on your preliminary drawings, you show a 35 foot height, but we specified a 45 foot height on our PD. Are you planning on amending your building plans to a 45 foot height? Or is that just to uh, allow future expansion? It, it, it's purely just to give us flexibility. We have uh, flat roofs right now, which uh, then um, will not exceed the 35 feet, but we just don't want it to be encroaching uh, against any kind of zoning rules. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from council or additional information that Mr. Murphy or Ms. Sharp thinks we need to have? I think we've gotten a lot of information. We've been talking about this for a while. Uh, also, <laughs> when I ask for council comments, uh, Mr. Hall, Harrison, our youth counselor, that you're welcome to chime in too. This is more interesting than some of the things we approve. Um, so if you have comments, feel free. Thank okay. you so much. Good deal. Okay, so we have three items in front of us, as Ms. Sharp detailed. Each will be a separate vote from council, and on each I would accept public comment. Um, and so we'll start with the first one, which is the preliminary plan development. Um, and so I will look to our attendees list to see if anyone is raising their hand to make any sort of public comment on that. I don't see any, so we could entertain a motion. Mayor, I'll make Mayor, a motion. Uh, go ahead. I'd move to approve the base camp preliminary plan development. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a first and a second, and so now we'll have a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Biden, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And that will lead us into item 13, which is the final plan development for base camp. Also accepting public comment on this um, item before we have a motion. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve base camp final plan development. I'll second that. Thank you. Let's have a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And that moves us into the third item for base camp which is the um, council consideration of the preliminary plat. 
again, there is an opportunity for public comment on this item. So I'm looking for any hands raised. Seeing none, I'll ask someone to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the base camp preliminary plat expressly conditioned upon the city staff ensuring that all policies, regulations, ordinance, and municipal code provisions are met and that the applicant adequately address all of the staff's concerns prior to the execution of the final plat. The city staff is not authorized by this approval to execute the final plat prior to all conditions being satisfied. Second that. Well done. We have a first and a second and we'll vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Yes. Roy Anderson? Uh, aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you, and thank you to Mr. Sukup and Mr. Sukup for joining us tonight. Um, we look forward to, uh, I think, seeing you um, again with as the project develops. Well, uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to be part of Montrose. We're excited to get started. We assume we'll be getting started in April, and we're hoping that the first four apartment buildings are completed in the next 10 to 12 months. Great, thanks for that information. I think that is uh, good to know. Okay, um, we will keep plugging right along because we have a, we still have more on our agenda tonight. So um, next item is 15, which is resolution 2021-02. This is consideration of a resolution setting April 6, 2021 as the hearing date for the annexation of the Valley Ranch Edition North. Um, Amy, are you going to present these together? Um, I was going to present them separate. But okay. Yeah, they're... That that works. I just okay. I wanted to, I wanted to tee it up for you, right? Okay. <laughs> so I will turn it over to our senior planner, um, Ms. Amy Sharp. Okay. Yeah, they're two separate annexations, so I'll do them separately. But since a lot of the information is similar, I'll make sure I just refer back to the previous. So I'm not repeating myself so much. <laughs> um, this is just the annexation schedule. This is in your packet. Um, as you mentioned tonight, it's just the resolution to set a hearing date and then planning commission will be meeting on March 10th um, to recommend the initial zoning to city council. This is the location of the Valley Ranch Edition North. So it's located just south of Ogden Road. Um, this one is approximately 60.81 acres in size. It is within the city's urban growth boundary, the city of Montrose water and sewer service area. Um, as you can see here, the area that's shaded in kind of the gray or off-white area, that's city limits. Um, we will be doing an annexation agreement, and the purpose of this annexation is just to allow for future residential development in the area. Um, this next slide just talks about the zoning of additions and how the Planning Commission will recommend a zoning to City Council. The zoning of the surrounding area, as shown on this map, is R1A to the north. And then the proposed zoning is going to be R3A, followed by R2 to the direct south. And I'll kind of go through what some of those are. Um, it's also actually in your packet. It talks about what the different allowed uses are in those different zoning districts. Um, for reference to this area that's directly to the north, um, here in the R1A is owned by the same property owner as what's going to be this annexation. Um, the property that's kind of to the north and the east is a different property owner. And this is just directly south of the bridges, just for reference. So in our comprehensive plan, this area is listed as residential mixed density medium, which provides for a variety of mixed um, housing types, ranging from single family homes, townhomes, duplexes, and triplexes. Wanted to kind of give an overview. We talked at work session about this project, but we have some questions about the transportation plan. So this is kind of an overview of our transportation plan in our comprehensive plan. Um, I'm gonna zoom in and we're kind of looking down in this area right here for reference. And so as you can see here, this is a proposed um, minor arterial that would go through this property in the future. This is just a general idea of where that would be. It doesn't have to be exactly that location. Um, but just wanted to kind of give an overview because I know somebody had a question about um, whether or not our transportation plan had any proposed roads to go through this area. And so there is one going north to south 
and then the proposed um, extension of Otter Road heading east. Um, this is within our growth area too, which just means that existing infrastructure is nearby or in place. And as I mentioned, this area is urbanizing. We'll be doing an annexation agreement and impact report um, is consistent with the public health, health, safety and welfare annexation policies and our comprehensive plan. And we will be recommending approval of the annexation as well as the R3A medium high density district and the R2 low density district for this property. And I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from council? So basically all we're doing tonight through this resolution is setting basically the calendar of this event and how it goes forward. So we're not annexing anything tonight, we're setting the calendar so the public knows what to expect for the process. Great. Okay, so um, we will accept public comment. I do not see anyone raising their hand. And so I'll come back to council and ask for a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2021-2 as presented. I'll second that. Thank you. We have our first and a second, so we can vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. I'm sorry, Doug. I didn't hear you. Yes. Thank you. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman. Yes. Dave Frank. Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So moving on to our next agenda item, it is agenda item 16. It is also a resolution. This time it's 2021-03 with the same kind of a calendaring procedure, but a different piece of land. So Ms. Sharp, take it away. Great. Thank you. Like you mentioned, the schedule is exactly the same, so I won't go into detail on that. It's exactly the same as the one we just did. And this parcel is located just directly south of the one for um, Valley Ranch Edition North. So it is um, along Otter Road. Whoops, I didn't mean to hit Ford. <laughs> it's along Otter Road, and then it kind of lines up with this ditch right here. Um, this one is about 70 um, acres. Parcel number one outlined in this black is 66.33 acres. And then parcel three over here is 3.83 acres. Um, it's also within the city's urban growth boundary and water and sewer service area. Um, it's located near a lot of city limits, as you can see from this map. Um, and an annexation agreement will also be required for this one. And once again, this one is to allow for future residential development. Um, a site overview, I thought this might be helpful to kind of see how these two pieces fit together and where it is in relation to some other development in town. Um, so this one over here, the top part is the Valley Ranch Edition North. This one is the south. Um, this over here is Otter Pond. So there is still some area um, in between these two. Um, they're gonna be requesting very low density district here, which means um, one acre lots. Um, and then um, the brook is located just south of here. Um, so as I mentioned, the zoning is proposed as R1, which is very low density district in this area. Um, Otter Pond is kind of off this map over here to the west, um, but directly adjacent to this, we have R3A medium high density and R3 medium density, and then agriculture in the county surrounding it. This is just the annexation map. Um, this one is also listed as residential mixed density medium, just as the Valley Ranch North was. Um, same thing, transportation map, I thought it'd be helpful to know. Here's an overview map and then the detail map that shows the proposed, uh, not proposed, but kind of anticipated roads that would go through this development going north and south and then east and west for Otter Road. This one's also in growth area too, just as the previous one was. And um, in summary, we are um, gonna be recommending re approval of the annexation and of the R1 very low density district. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Questions? I see Councilor Anderson's hand. It keeps disappearing, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Amy, I was just curious. Um, it would appear from that map that 
there will be a large tract of land that's still in the county between the area of Otter Pond and then where these two um, annexations will occur. Um, is that any kind of a problem that we have large enclaves like that in the middle of what's going to be city limits? So that's zoned. So that's zoned as R3A and R3. Maybe I'll pull that up once again. So it's not but it's right. Still, it's still county? No. Oh, I misunderstood then. Okay. That's okay. Let me, that's okay. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. That would help if I did that. It helps if I share it with you guys and not myself. <laughs> I think Rory's talking about the parcel of land directly to the west of the US. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, directly to the west. It it didn't appear gray. Yes, this brown area. So this was just an overview map to show you um, kind of the location, but this shows the zoning. So this map was just kind of to show, I didn't want to put any color on here because I wanted to be able to see like how the parcels were identified and where the different housing developments were. Um, this map shows the zoning. So directly west of this parcel, it is city limits and it is currently zoned as R3A and R3. But that's okay. undeveloped, but that's undeveloped right now. So if you look back to this map and you look at this parcel, if you can see my cursor, it's that's it's undeveloped farm, right now. It's farm fields, but it's still in the city limits and it's zoned. Correct. It's already zoned uh, as R3A and R3. Okay, that's that's a good clarification. Thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from council or youth councilor on this item? I don't see any, and we will accept public comment. So I'm also looking at our attendee list for any hands. I do not see any, so I'll come back to council. Gosh, I'm almost losing track because we're on page four. Okay, I will come back to council for a motion on resolution 2021-3. Madam Mayor, I would move to adopt resolution 2021-03 as presented. I'll second that. Thank you, we have a first and a second, so we'll do a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. Aye. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. That puts us moving on to the next item, which is item 17, and that's resolution 2021-04. And this is council consideration of a resolution setting um, April 6, 2021 is the 50 edition. So similar process, different piece of property. I'll turn it over to Ms. Chow. All right, and this will be my last one and then you can move on to something other than planning. <laughs> All right, let me grab this one. All right, so this is the exact same schedule that we have for the um, previous two. So I won't go into those in detail. Um, we'll have the Planning Commission hearing on this one for March 10th, and tonight is just the resolution to set the hearing date. You guys have heard this one before at work, work session. Um, this is the general vicinity map that just kind of shows where this one is located. It's basically just the um, highway along between 6600 road or 6650 road and 6700 road and includes a portion of the highway and then the right of way on either side of the highway. Um, this project site is just a little over 15 acres in size. It's also within the city's urban growth boundary and our water and city sewer service area. Um, as you can see here, it's surrounded almost every um, area except for to the north by city limits. I will say that since this map has been produced, um, we've been we have updated this map, and recently you guys did the Lynch edition um, annexation last year, I believe it was, um, and it was this area kind of on the eastern side of this annexation into the north. So this is kind of a cleanup annexation from that last one that we did for the Lynch edition, um, just to bring this road into city limits to help with. Um, just responding to future emergencies um, as well as road maintenance issues. So it's still CDOT, um, 
road, um, but it just helps us to know. Obviously, it's kind of confusing when we have city limits and then we got county and then we got city limits again. So we just want to bring that into the city so that it's consistent. Um, this shows the zoning of the surrounding area. So we got a variety of business districts as well as a few residential. Um, we're going to be propo we're proposing B2 Highway Commercial District. And that's consistent with um, some properties that are to the south and also the highway to the east is also B2. And that just fits the best with it being a highway corridor. This map shows just the annexation map for reference. In our comprehensive plan, this is listed as a major center. Now I can let you read through that as far as um, what that intent is in our comprehensive plan. But again, this is really just bringing in the road and the right of way into city limits. There's not um, any future development proposed within that right of way. Um, this is located within our growth area one, meaning that infrastructure is currently in place in this area. And annexation import impact report will be required and staff will be recommending approval of this annexation and the B2 highway commercial district. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you. Is it basically all road? I mean, we have to annex it. I mean, we have to annex it. We don't have to annex it. It makes sense to annex it. And then once annexed, we have to zone it, but it's probably all like CDOT right of way. I mean, nothing's gonna be built there. We just have to zone it something. Right, it's the road and the right of way. And so, yeah, we have to zone it as something and B2 is what we zone almost all of our highway commercial district areas in most cases. Okay. Any other council questions? I see Councilor Frank has his hand. Just another clarification that annexations like this are really driven by the annexation and incorporation of the surrounding and uh, I guess you call it edges uh, into city limits. Yeah, and we felt that, you know, after that Lynch addition was annexed that was directly north of there, that it just made sense to annex the road in this area as well to make it consistent with the surrounding area. Um, we reached out to CDOT to make sure that they were, you know, in agreement, but this is really just a city initiated annexation. Because both sides of the road are in the city. Correct. So now the road's in the city. Okay. The road and both sides. So this includes not just the road, but the right of way as well. Okay. So the area to the south is already annexed. Some of the area to the north is annexed, but not all of it. Okay. Any other council questions? I don't see any. Okay, then we will accept public comment. I'm not seeing any public comment, but I will take this opportunity. If you're in, in the public and you find this sort of thing fascinating, and you really want to roll up your sleeves and dig in to zoning and annexations, there are currently openings on the City Planning Commission. And Council just recently decided to appoint not only a Planning Commission member, but an alternate and extended the deadline. I believe that deadline is now closer to the end of March for applications and more information can be found on the City website. So if you're riveted to planning decisions like this, um, that's a little advertisement that you can get more involved. Okay, I didn't see any public comment in the meantime, so I'll come back to council for a motion. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve resolution 2021-04. I'll second that. Thank you, we have a first and a second, so we'll go ahead and vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So now we move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is number 18, and that's the Montrose Public Safety Complex Construction Authorization. Um, this is council consideration of the authorization of $16,212,884 to be used for the construction of the Montrose Public Safety Complex. I will turn it over to our Public Works Manager, Jim Scheid, for an introduction to this item. Um, oh, he's got his neck tie on. Right, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Yeah, I'm wearing the tie out this year so far. Um, so there's been no changes on this item since we discussed at work session 
Um, but our team is in the audience in case there's any questions for them. Uh, I think me and Blaine will give a brief overview of the items we discussed, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, so we talked a lot about the process uh, of our team and the involvement um, to get us to this point, and mainly focused a lot on the fluctuations in the um, materials market and how concerning those are right now. And um, many of the motions we're making now are, are in reaction to that, try to get ahead of um, those prices that are hard to predict. Um, so the documents in the, in the packet, I think, help explain the recommendation, um, which include mainly the um, DD estimate, the design development estimate um, that Shaw provided. And that's a, a competitive, competitively procured um, estimate uh, for each, um, each division without, uh, throughout the project. Um, it also includes our contingencies and utility costs, um, permit costs, things like that, pretty much every cost that would be associated with construction. Um, and then also included in the packet is a summary of our uh, budget status log. And that shows a lot of the items that us as a team um, talked through and um, looked for cost saving opportunities and ended up accepting uh, well over a million dollars worth of those um, cost savings to the project. And, and those are in summary on that uh, budget uh, status log. Um, and so I'll also hand it over to Blaine to talk a little bit about his his portion of the project and then um, then we'll close it from there. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, you know, really the PD's portion of the project has been to make sure that the building, I've said this before, the building works for us instead of we work for the building. And I think we've, uh, you know, with the team, the team's input, I think we've come up with a design that works very well for our staff. Um, it's very efficient. There's no fluff in it, um, but it's also something that we can grow into over time. And I think it's very tech technology friendly uh, for the future as well, so that we can, we can try to anticipate some of the future needs of law enforcement um, as, uh, as time goes on. So I'm very excited. As Jim said, we've We've moved about $1.4 million worth of items um, out of the project into alternates to try to keep within the budget. And, uh, and this tonight, um, if approved, will keep us nimble so that we can uh, handle some of those market fluctuations. So the project's been, we've tried to be very inclusive with our PD staff members. It's not just uh, uh, the city management team and design team uh, designing this building. Uh, we've, we've gotten quite a bit of input from all of our employees to make sure it's also a building that uh, they're uh, excited about and, and satisfied to be able to work in. So um, I think we're ready to go. We're ready to go. And with your approval and consent, we can, we can put a shovel in the ground. So I just once again like to um, thank uh, City Council and our community for just the overwhelming support that we've received during this project. And, and once again, um, we are... Uh, we're ready, so thank you. Very exciting information and very thorough. Thanks for um, sharing all that. I know you did bring the um, whole team or many members of the team, I see their names in our attendees list tonight. So council, here's a great opportunity. Does anyone have specific questions for um, either our city staff or anyone on the um, team for the police um, public safety complex building? We've talked about it a lot, and it's gonna um, it's gonna be a really big deal to our community. And I'm excited to see us moving forward on this, Mr. Frank. I would just say that if the public wants to kind of hear some of the discussions that we have had, all of that material is available on recordings of our work sessions and prior council meetings. So if you're curious about a specific issue, you can certainly contact Mr. Scheid or or one of the city staff and would be more than happy to let you know what the discussion was that led to this point. Absolutely. It is a long discussion and we did talk for quite a while at the work session about it and uh, the CMGC process and the design process we've been through. It's, it's a long explanation and we've been at it for uh, well over a year now. So, um, but yeah, we'd be happy to um, answer any questions anybody has, but the work session probably explains a lot of that. 
Okay, I don't see any other council members' hands raised. Mr. Hall, Council Member Hall, do you um, have any comments to make? It's kind of an exciting meeting to be at, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I kind of heard my dad just kind of talking over it at home. So I asked him a few questions beforehand and he kind of answered all of them. So yeah, sounds interesting. So yeah. yeah. You did, you had the ability to ask all your questions over the dinner table. So you didn't have to bring them with you to the meeting. Great. Okay. How about our public? Um, I would welcome any comments from our public um, about this agenda item. I'm looking for raised hands. And again, that raised hand button is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, if anyone wishes to comment. I don't see any, so I'll come back to council um, for a motion. Madam Mayor, I would make a motion to authorize $16,212,884 to be used for the construction of the Montrose Public Safety Complex as presented. I'll second that. Great, we've got a first and a second, so we'll do a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Um, exciting day for our Montrose Police Department for sure. Um, I think this is gonna be a very meaningful civic building to our community. Either, um, either Mr. Scheid or Chief Hall, any? Comments? Or are you good to go? Uh, just once again, I'd like to I'd like to thank City Council and our community. Let's get, we just couldn't do it without all of their support, all the way from 2A to where we are today. And and uh, this is going to be a, an excellent community fixture, and we've designed it to make it so, so that it's an inviting, friendly place for our community to come because that's what that's what law enforcement needs to be. We're we're in the community. We're part of the community. And our building needs to to reflect that. So thank all, thank you um, to all of you. Yeah, thank you for your support. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, bid package one closes later this week, um, so we're we're at a very exciting part of the project. And and thank you. And thank you to all the team members who came to show your support. We we do we see your names in the attendees list, and um, and knowing you, we have a great team behind us. Um, I think it is really good to know, and thank you all for coming to our council meeting tonight. Okay, the next thing on our agenda is Ordinance 2529. Um, this is a first reading of an ordinance vacating a right of way deemed a surplus. This is South First, it's the public safety complex, and so I will turn it back over to Public Works Manager Jim Scheid. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. This is also related to the police department project, um, and it is uh, vacating um, right of way along South First, um, basically to extend the uh, piece that was vacated early in the project. And at that point, uh, there was a um, the intention was to build portion of the building into South First, um, but we didn't at that point we didn't have any design done, didn't have any many details on what the building would need to uh, need to cover. And so as design uh, developed, we started we started to see that um, the building was actually the community room, especially was not exactly where we had anticipated. And actually, a lot of the building came into uh, the right of way. And um, so that's what this vacation is for is to vacate um, the rest of the portion of South First that this building would occupy. Um, and we waited until this point to bring it to council uh, to make sure there was no further changes. We waited till late in design, knowing it was an item we needed to clean up, um, but wanted to make sure that it was final. And um, our design is nearly complete now. Um, we're in, well into the construction document phase, which means there won't be any changes at this point. We are, we are well into the final stages of design. So with that, uh, nothing has changed on this either since we, we talked a little more about it at work session. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions that have come up. Um, but I think the maps in the in the packet 
um, explain pretty well the location that we're talking about. I agree, they do. And for the public, those maps are available in our council packet that show the portion of the public right away that we would be vacating. Um, any council member questions? Okay, we do hold a hearing, um, which is slightly more formal than just public comment. So I will open a hearing, which means that anyone from the public who wishes to comment may do so. I don't see any hands, so I'll close the hearing and come back to council for a motion. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve ordinance 2529 on first reading. I got it. Thank you. We have a first and a second, so we'll have a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. Aye. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman. Yes. Dave Frank. Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So that moves us to agenda item 20 tonight, and that is a contract amendment authorization. This is council consideration of an amendment to a contract with Huddleston Berry Engineering and Testing to add construction material testing for the Montrose Public Safety Complex for the not to exceed amount of $205,950. And again, I'll turn it back over to Public Works Manager, Jim Scheid. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Again, this is for the, um, the Police Department project and uh, as you said, it is for construction materials testing, uh, which is a, um, a normal consultant that would work directly for the owner on, uh, on many projects, but especially on something of this size. And so we, uh, we contract directly with uh, Huddleston Berry. Um, they also provided our geotechnical engineering, which included our soils report and uh, soils engineering. Um, anyway, this would be the testing portion throughout the project. Um, and we are recommending we add this to uh, their contract. And it, and it was procured that way originally with this intention. Um, we were not able to put a dollar amount to that until design was uh, nearly finished. And that's why it's coming back now uh, with a dollar amount that we can add to their contract. And we hire them and they work directly for us because they're basically checking the materials that the general contractor is using and approving. And so we want them independent. We don't want them answering to the general contractor. We want them to be our direct um, contact. Is that why it's not part of that amount we just approved? That's right. Yep. They work directly for us and not for general contractor or any of the subs. Uh, that way uh, we know that the items they're testing uh, we're getting honest results for. They work for us. There'd be no reason for them to um, give us false readings or anything like that. If if they work for a general contractor, um, you know, who knows how that would, would go. So that's why typically CMT is uh, owner direct. And are they testing concrete? Are they testing steel? Or what kind of things are they, what kind of materials are they testing for us? Yeah, that's right. There's our um, compaction on soils, concrete, um, I guess initially they, they would probably be doing um, uh, observation of the uh, pile installation. So they would, they'll um, be sure that those are installed properly and to the correct depth. Um, and then they would go into yeah, compaction of um, soils and backfill material and then into concrete. Um, and they would be with throughout the project entirely, even into steel and finishes, some things like drywall. Um, so they would do testing and even um, some third party testing throughout the project. Other questions from council? Materials testing is fascinating. Okay, it's apparently just me. Um, okay, any, um, we will, like we have on every item, we will take public comment on this agenda item. I don't see any, so back to council for motion. I'll make a motion to approve the, an amendment to the contract with Huddleston and Barry Engineering and Testing for the not to exceed amount of $205,950. I second it. Thank you. We have a first and a second, so we'll take a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. Aye. Roy Anderson. 
Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So that moves us on to page five and item number 21 of tonight's agenda, which is equipment purchase recommendation. And this is council consideration of the purchase of one Vogel, I think I hope I said that right, asphalt paving machine from Conant Equipment of Grand Junction for the total purchase price of $169,924. And again, Public Works Manager Jim Shy to tell us about this piece of equipment. Yep. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, yes, this item hasn't changed since we discussed it either, um, but a overview is yes, it's a, um, a Vogel asphalt laid on machine that uh, we are replacing a, a machine that we currently use and um, we would be recommending we purchase this through a um, cooperative purchasing agreement and it's a source well contract in this case from uh, hone in equipment out of Grand Junction um, and this this item is something that uh, again the city owns a lay down machine now that we would be replacing this one's slightly different it's actually smaller than the one we currently own um, and better suits the, um, the needs of our division, the way we operate now. Um, it is slightly higher cost than what we anticipated in our budget, um, but it will still create a savings to the fleet fund. So um, there'll still be approximately $35,000 in savings for buying this machine versus um, a similar machine to the one we have now. Um, and it's just actually less than we anticipated. We anticipated saving about 50,000 and we'll actually only save about 35,000 by making this purchase. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, but other than that, we are recommending purchase from Honan uh, for $169,924. Great, I see your hands up. So I'll go first to Mayor Pro Tem Glassbell and then to Councillor Frank. Jim, will you take the old machine and be selling it off so that we will have some something coming back from that? Absolutely. Um, we are, we already sold it. Um, so it was part of the disposal list that was approved earlier this year, and it was sold on Gov Deals, uh, I believe, last week. So it is uh, already sold. Yep. Did we get a good price? We did. I believe it's, uh, I want to say $38,000. Um, don't quote me on that. It was very close to that. Councillor Frank, was that your question? I saw your hand up. Okay, um, good deal. And like all of our equipment replacement, we save up for them throughout the life of the equipment so that when it needs to be replaced, we have the money already saved to replace it. That's correct. Great. Okay, I think um, we should do that for everything in our lives, right? Save it up. <laughs> That's not always possible. Okay, let's um, go ahead and accept public comment on this item. I don't see any, so I'll come back to council for a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd move to approve the purchase of one Vogel asphalt paving machine from Honan Equipment for the total purchase price of $169,924 as presented. Second it. Thank you. We have a first and a second, a second from Councilor Anderson, and we'll go ahead and vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Yes. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And then now that we um, go into the portion of our agenda, which is a little more unstructured, and we'll start with staff reports. And so without any particular specific reports on tonight's agenda, um, are there any city staff members who have a piece of information they need to share with us or the public tonight? And if so, please unmute yourself, turn on your video, raise your hand, get my attention. I think we all went home. Oh no, I still see a whole bunch. They're all still here. We'll get them home soon. Mr. Bell, do you have anything to add on behalf of, uh, okay. Then I will go next to our youth city council comments. This is the portion of the agenda where our youth city councilor has an opportunity to update us on their project of the month. So Mr. Hall, what have you got for youth council? Well, what I have for you tonight is we currently have completed our project for February, which is our drug prevention video. 
So what the video was, was it was a series of activities that the youth council came up with, whether that be sports or some other things. And what we did is we broke it up into different parts and we are releasing those parts of the video day by day. So we have two of them up right now and they're just different videos of our youth counselors being like, hey, here are some different activities and where you can do them and don't do drugs. Good deal. And you can find that on our youth council Instagram. And that's all I have for you tonight. Great. Do you guys know what project you're going to be taking on for March? Um, not currently right now, but I'm sure we'll find out tomorrow and we'll have an answer for you by the next council meeting. That's great. I'm so impressed that every month you guys have been able to pick a new project, tackle it and get it done. That's really impressive. Thank you very much. I'd also like to add the new police building does sound very fascinating and interesting. And honestly, I am very excited to see this thing start getting built. So thank you. Did your dad come up and tell you to say that? <laughs> no, he did not. That was all me. So good, good. It is exciting. I think you'll look back at it someday and you'll say, man, I remember I was in high school when they approved that. That was a long time ago. We put a time capsule in the ground. Okay, let's go on then to city council comments. Um, any comments from my fellow city councilors tonight? Okay, I think everyone is a long meeting and we want to be done. So um, with that, I won't add anything in the labor or meeting any further. Uh, motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Let's adjourn by acclamation. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us.